Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the anniversary show and opening of Embodied Time and Space works by Susan Patrice over here and Donna Moore over here on the wall. In a few short minutes, we will have Donna and Susan joining us to talk about their work. I would like to welcome my intern, Grace, to the audience. And, um, oh, there is Donna. Very, um, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to have an artist talk with Donna Moore and Susan Patrice, where they're going to talk a little bit about their work, um, how their work intersects, and how it also plays into the community at large. So if you'll just excuse me, I'm going to invite them into the room to talk with me, and we will get started. Here we go. This is the technical button pressing thing. Um, and here we go. I am so very pleased to have everybody here tonight. Um, I, I'll take a minute while they're getting ready to um, introduce that our, our food feature for this particular show um, is a One Acre Cafe. And um, Susan, if you could get some earbuds or something, I'm hearing some feedback. Okay. <laughs> no problem. That's all right. There's always a little bit of a technical prep work. I want to thank everybody for being here in the audience. I want to wave at some of you. This is so wonderful. So our food feature for this evening is One Acre Cafe. They are based in Johnson City, and they source all of their food locally as much as possible. Um, the chef, Bob, has something very special um, that he wanted to share with y'all. Um, I have his notes on what the food looks like, so I'll share that with you while we are getting set up. So One Acre Cafe is based in Johnson City, and they are a, a group, a nonprofit group, that their motto is One World Everybody Eats. So they do... Um, they do food and meals that are by donation or by volunteer. Like you can, you don't have to, it's, it's pay as you can, basically. They have a suggested donation for each of their meals. And um, some, of, some of Donna's lovely works over here on the wall, proceeds from, some proceeds from the sales of these works will actually be donated to their work here in Johnson City. They fed a lot of people during the pandemic. And Chef Bob here wanted me to share with you that we've got um, <clears throat> rosemary chicken with sweet peppers and spinach and the, the vegetables, uh, the pan roasted medley of fresh vegetables. And these are local sliced tomatoes. Um, and they are from Vest Greenhouse right here in Johnson city. The cucumber and zucchini were from a farmer named Larry Moore. And all of the herbs were from another fellow artist who I happen to know whose name is Lynn Gavette. So this is like a community love meal right here and um, they've been around since about 2012 and um, one of the programs that they had over the summers was feeding school kids lunch when there were no schools open so if you haven't heard of them please go to oneacrecafe.org and check them out it's a really wonderful and beautiful model of sharing food and um, love with the world <laughs> So that's my little introduction, and I'd like to officially welcome Susan and Donna here. And it's so great to have you. I'm so pleased to have this conversation, and I want to welcome everybody in our audience and invite them to ask any questions in the comments. So if you, um, if you see any comments that you would like to respond to um, in, in the whole process, feel free to do so. So with that... Which one of you would like to introduce yourself first? <laughs> <laughs> I will, okay. I will. Okay. okay. Um, my name is Donna Moore, and um, I live in Blaine, Tennessee, which is just near Knoxville. And I am a photographer and an educator more than a photographer, I guess. I like to uh, share what I know about photography and try to interest other people in exploring the possibilities of photography also. Um, I am a member of A1 Lab Arts, which is a community cooperative in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I am also um, a co-director of The Big Camera. It's a nonprofit traveling big camera obscura that we take around and do workshops for kids in the community. 
Can you briefly explain for those non-photography people what a camera obscura is? Okay, so a camera <laughs> obscura, um, it, imagine um, a camera. So a camera obscura is like a big, it means dark room. And so when you look inside this dark room, you can see an image in there upside down and backwards, which is how your eye works and how cameras work. So what we in essence have is a giant camera that you look inside and you can see images there. And we have, we use it as a pinhole camera. We take photos with it, portraits with it. We do workshops with kids. We do pinhole and cyanotype, lumen prints. So we're trying to keep the photography going in this digital age. And that is actually part of this body of work. Would you like to introduce that or should we bounce to Susan? Susan, you want to unmute and just speak a little, introduce yourself first, maybe? Sure. Hey, Go I'm Susan it. Patrice. I am um, the director of Maker's Circle, which is a photography retreat and residency center. And that's how I met Jocelyn. She came here and worked with us for a while. And that was great. Um, yeah, so we offer um, workshops and residencies and also run a number of community art projects out of our location here in near Asheville, North Carolina. Which is super beautiful. And what about you personally as a photographer? Uh, I'm a documentary photographer by trade. Um, probably more lately, I've been teaching contemplative photography, which to me is just the same thing. Um, <laughs> documentary photography that working definition of contemplative practice is a long loving look at reality. And to me, that is like, might as well just be the definition <laughs> of photography in general. So say <laughs> contemplative photography is a bit redundant, but um, yeah, so I practice as a documentary photographer and most recently um, more documenting nature. It's not been what I've done for the majority of my career. I've focused on um, documenting Southern culture and, um, particularly from a rural perspective, which is I grew up um, rural and poor. So, um, yeah. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I would love for you to start with elaborating on what that contemplative process looks like as it pertains to um, your landscapes. And I can take a tour of the gallery while you're talking. Sounds great. Yeah. So the landscape work was not intentional. Um, I had um, a, a really rough couple of years, some, some healing from some trauma. And so I was spending time in nature and I was working with someone doing some somatic and um, exercises, which were meant to help um, heal. And I noticed that their exercises, I felt like would have been more enhanced if I had used a creative practice. So I started using photography as a way of connecting with the natural world and um, something really remarkable happened about three months into the project. I was doing a number of these exercises, one on expanding peripheral vision. And my peripheral vision expanded so far that I actually started to see, notice that I was seeing rounds again. So as all you photographers know, lenses are round and we actually only use what they call the sweet spot of a lens and your eyes see round, all lenses see round. So I started building and constructing cameras that photograph round so that it would be more um, representational to the way that I now um, view and see the world. More importantly, though, when my vision changed, I noticed something really dramatic, which was when my vision expanded and was, uh, you know, I had much more wider peripheral vision, I actually felt really different in the world. I felt like I was standing in the center of an enveloping landscape. And when my narrow, when my, my vision constricted, it actually moved me outside again, where I was this outsider looking in at the world. So I started teaching a contemplative photography practice that helped place people in the center of what they're trying to photograph so that the photographs emerge out of an experience of connectedness. Um, and it has just been really remarkable, mostly around um, landscape and nature photography with the idea that um, climate crisis is a crisis of intimacy. So we use camera as a tool for deepening our intimacy with the natural world. I've been teaching it all over the country and um, people are just reporting such amazing and incredible experiences. And plus the photographs that result from the students' work has just been mind blowing. So um, yeah, so that's the story of this round work. 
And this work, is it, um, is it going to be displayed elsewhere? Is there a place where it's going to go next? Because I know that you recently had a very wonderful exhibit at the, um, was that at the Arboretum? Yeah, so the North Carolina Arboretum, we did a really, one, one of my favorite exhibits that I've had so far, which is, it was a show of all that work of the enveloping landscape work. So it was three square miles photographed the same forest the first year, every single day um, for a year, and then two years after, um, m not quite daily, but, but pretty regularly. So it's um, three square miles of forest documented over that length of time. And when we decided to teach that practice, when I decided to, the North Carolina Arboretum agreed to pilot that program. So that exhibition wow. at the Arboretum was both my photographs and then a year long practice commitment from, from a variety of people. And what was so amazing about that show is the majority of the people weren't photographers. Some of them use a camera for the first time in their life. And um, when you walked through the show, you really couldn't tell who had been practicing for years and years and who had just picked up the camera for the first time. And um, yeah, the photographs were beautiful. The show was so moving. And I was especially touched by um, what people shared about their experience of falling in love um, with the natural world. And so it's changed how I think about art. I think about art now as um, a practice in loving. And um, I'm especially interested in the work of Sally Adkins, who was the person who founded the Expressive Arts Therapy Program at Boone, North Carolina. And she talks about um, poesis, which is a way of knowing through making. And that go mm. in, we go in with this idea that we're not there to do a project. We're not there knowing in advance that through the creative engagement, there's an unfolding, a mutual unfolding that happens between you and what you're photographing. And this conversation emerges where you're, you're impacting it, but it's also radically impacting you. And I would say for sure with the developing was before I came in. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. <laughs> um, I think that we have some connection points to make between your two practices, but I want to give Donna the microphone so that she can express and resonate and share her relationship to landscape and time and community practice as well. Um, Donna, are you ready? Yes, yes. I've so, got your work behind me. So Let's I started this project probably, it's an ongoing project since 2006, back when I discovered pinhole photography. I mean, to me, the idea that you could build a camera and capture light and create an image is just so fascinating. I mean, there's no lens involved here. There's nothing but a tin can and a hole in a piece of aluminum and the sun that creates these images. And um, it seems to me to be a meditative practice also and a collaboration with nature because I don't know what I'm going to get. I put them out there and then you just wait. Some are a day, some are a week, some are months, some are a year. And just to see what can happen in that time is, is quite incredible. And the way I think about this too is it's connected to time and, and things that happen like birthdays, anniversaries, even deaths, and um, uh, a long-term exhibit. So all of this is a collaboration between me and the camera and nature and time. I mean, I'm capturing time there. Every line you see is the passage of the sun across the sky. The lines you don't see as highlighted are cloudy days, shadowy days. So it's, it's quite amazing that you can capture this and it's just black and white photo paper in a camera a um, homemade camera so I don't even know where all the color from comes from either it's just magical so you discovered you've been working this way since 2006 you said for this project I've, for this I've project done, I've started pinhole photography then and I learned how to do this process and I've made other pinholes that are like 30 seconds, a minute, three minutes, different images. But this is my landscape work that I think um, is more a meditative thing, a more of a connection to the sun and nature and time and a memory of that time. 
because uh, my kids live far away. So one of these is his birthday, just mm -hmm. that day that the sun went across the sky. Another is an exhibit I did at A1 Lab Arts for a month, left the camera up for a month. Also, there's a connection to community with these, because with A1 Lab Arts one year, I passed out 30 cameras, and they put them up and brought them back to me, and we showed them at our annual meeting. So I'm trying to make a connection between the past, the future, now. Anyway, you just don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what you're going to get. Oh, we have a comment. Susan, I love how you have found ways to share your process with others and given no, um, no artists any other, uh, other vehicle by wit. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm really messing up this comment. <laughs> artists and another vehicle which they can use for self-expression. So that's a lovely, lovely comment. I want to encourage the audience who is watching to feel free to drop any questions for the artists that they want that are that come up, um, if just in conversation or in thinking. So what's interesting to me about the two of you is that it's see, like my perception of of why I wanted to put these two works together, um, these two bodies of work, is because I see you both moving in the same sort of conceptual gesture, but one of you using physical space and the other one using temporal space. And so I'm very, very interested in the intersection of um, making that space, taking the time to observe that space and contemplate that. And if there's anything that you would like to share that relates to that concept, you are more than welcome to elaborate on that. Um, and I would encourage you to do so. <laughs> Um, I, I, I just wanted to add that one, oops, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, this I is your thing. Add that one of the things that touches me so much about Donna's work is the relationship that she has to the moments that that time marks. And I, I just remember that I was so touched. She shared the story about setting one up a day that was your husband had surgery or you just mentioned setting up a camera on your son's birthday and that it, it creates this kind of field in which the, the image is taking shape inside of the meaning of that moment. And I just, ah, uh, can you say more about that, Donna? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think, I think that is part of it. I mean, they say photography is a decisive moment and you think of that as one little click of a camera and you have an image. But pinhole is not like that. It's time. Time is really so involved in all of this work. Even a day, when you look at a day, it's sun up to sundown. That's a lot of hours, you know, and the sun will go behind a cloud and you can see it all there. And I think this Try gives us one. a connection to the to the to how we live, to our world. So there they are. That's a longer that's probably a year or six months, that one. The ones with one line through them are usually the day. I put one up when my favorite best dog passed away right over his grave. And I got this amazing light that just came up. It was just amazing. So who knows why that happened? I also took one down the day a good friend of mine died. I mean, and the camera had shifted. So there's a lot that happens here that I have no control over. And I think... That's the part I really like about this also. What do you think that it means that you have less control over it and the, the hours spent on those moments? Because you're, you're talking about the amazingness of, of capturing the whole process, like the whole process of time passing. And how does that... How does that strike you in relationship to maybe past ways that you worked or, um, or is it, is it that there's more serendipity involved? I'm trying to dig a little bit here. Well, there, there is a lot of serendipity involved, but there is the process of, I have to make the camera. I have to point it in the right direction. The paper is important too. Different papers have different colors to them. So those are things I think about as I make these. But I think the thing that is so striking is that you can point it. Oh, here's an example. So I usually have this giant 4th of July party. Hundreds of people come. 
and we had to cancel it the last two years. So this last weekend, I put up the camera to document that time because there were no people going to be here. And guess what? There was no, I got nothing except the landscape. Mm. The sun, I didn't point it up high enough to get the sun. It was where I usually put it. I should have. But it was almost, there it was. It was just the mountains. I live in the foothills, but no sun, no people. So somehow there's something happening here that I don't have total control over. And I think if we live in nature, we don't have control over that. We have to accept a lot of things. And that's part of this work. So I want to shift a little bit into that specific process where you mentioned that different papers have different colors because we had a question come up in the comments about um, the aspects of solar graphs particularly and how that works. Um, is it positive paper and do you process them just like an enlargement print? Which I no. know that you explained to no. me. So, no, no. You know, okay. but we need to, we need to explain that. So us. it's just, it's a pinhole camera. You know, usually these are about the size of a coffee can and it's photo paper in there, just black and white enlarging photo paper. And as we know, there's hundreds of different kinds of paper. So I don't always write down exactly what paper it was. I'm not that accurate about this, but the colors depend on that. There's silver halide crystals in the paper and they react to the sun and light as in a lumen print. If anybody's made those, Ilford will make one color, like a purpley color, or Agfa will make a different color, maybe orangey colors. So you don't know. The pink ones up there are the negatives. That's what comes out of the camera. You can't process them because that paper has been exposed to the sun and just the, the lines have been burned into it. If you put that in the darkroom in chemicals, they would go black. So the only way you process them is you scan them. So you scan the pink, the pink ones are the negatives. You scan them, invert them, and you get the colored ones. And then you can tweak, tweak the color a little in Photoshop, just as you would if you were working on a darkroom print. But the part to me that is amazing is that print that you scanned, it's going to disappear. Even if I put it in a black bag and I save it and I try to keep it, it's not going to be there. And to me, that's like memory. There's a memory of this day, but like our memory, it fades of those days. You know, you may think mm. of your son's birthday and remember that day. But when you really think about it, two people could be there and it's not the same memories. And that's sort of what this is about. It's, I'm very it's, curious. Have you ever documented the process? This is me taking over here. Have you ever documented the process of that image fading? Well, I, I really haven't. I've looked in the bags <laughs> where I keep them. So when you scan them, there's a lot of light that hits them. So right then, that image is already halfway gone. If I, scan, if I mess up and try to scan it again, it's not as intense. So I already know that that image is going to be gone. And it's like a, a lumen print that you don't fix. If you put it in a black bag and you take it out later, there's going to be fainter lines on there. Mm -hmm. So I could at some point do that, but that's not really. I just know it's like your memory. It's not going to always be in there. No, mm -hmm. it changes. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, I'm very interested in the way that you very loosely construct your practice. And, um, and I've, I've noticed this, that one of the, one of the interesting things about pinhole photography is that it is so, it's so unusual because it's not practiced anymore that we get talking a lot about process, but can you explain, um, is there an overall reason why you gravitate towards these, um, these older processes and why you are placing an emphasis on film photography and its importance to community. Is, that, is there a significance there? Well, I think to me, I really like the old analog photography. And, I, and pinhole is really alive and well today. We have Worldwide Pinhole Day where thousands of people take a picture on the last April Sunday in April every year. And that's a website you can look at. It's called pinholeday.org. So a lot of people still do this. You can have a digital pinhole camera. A lot of people really like to make them. And I think the idea is you're capturing a different view of the world, I think, with a pinhole camera. It, it capture, it's got a, a wider focus. It's, it's a lot like it, Susan's it, images. It, it does. It sees more than you think it's going to see. And I think that's what's so fascinating to me about pinhole photography. Even if I do portraits, which I do with a big camera, we've done portraits of people, 
And they're big. They're 11 by 20, 24, big ones. You know, the people have to sit still for 14 seconds, 15 seconds. And, the, and you capture so much of their, their being in there because they can't really move. <laughs> so that fascinates me about pinhole. With a lens, you can adjust it and people can sit still for, what, a 40th of a second, a click. But pinhole, there's, it's more contemplative to me. I think there's more, there's more soul in there somehow to me. I think that's an excellent segue to shift back to Susan's work. And, um, and as we're talking, I know that you two are friends, but I would love to have you two feel free to ask each other questions as well. Um, for those of you who have just joined, this is the anniversary opening of Eat Art Space, the pop-up dining room gallery from Appalachia. And I have Susan Patrice and Donna Moore with me. And, um, and we're talking about their photographic work, which you can see on the website and Donna Moore's solar grams are available for sale, and some of those proceeds will go to benefit um, a nonprofit in Johnson City. So um, we were just talking about the contemplative nature of pinhole photography, and I, I want to turn over to Susan because just like Donna is putting together these uh, pinhole cameras and being intentional about how she chooses her paper most of the time, um, Susan is, I mean, like, it still blows my mind that you have constructed your own cameras to photograph in the round and the drive to do that in addition to what your contemplative process looks like uh, as you approach this landscape. Okay, but like, that's a topic that I'm very interested in you elaborating on. And you can go off from there. Go off the rails. <laughs> well, I was, I was touched by Donna's, you know, saying, talking about how a change in perspective, right, can change everything. And I do think that was part of what happened with the round work is that I got to see, I got to see nature naturally, that if I were to return back um, and, and sort of disconnect from the very linearized world that I have to live in on my day to day, looking at screens, looking out of windows, driving cars, um, that my eye returns back to seeing the way it was designed to naturally see. Um, and I, I love this idea that the way we see changes what how we experience the world. And we think about language, we know that different language language creates culture and with photography it is a visual language and um how is donna's visual language of spontaneity and chance and synchronicity uh, you know like that sh starts to shape how i'm experiencing the world when i spend time with her photographs and i think it's true for me in the practice of shooting round that it changes um how how i experience the world which i had mentioned before um, the other thing that I really love, um, Jocelyn, is, is how you use the word embodied. And I think that uh, that is one thing that Donna and I also share in common is this embodied approach to how we um, engage through our craft and um, bringing the body back into the process. So in a contemplative practice, I actually use a, a series of what I call gestural prayers it's, it's a way that I show up and bring my body fully into the moment. And from that place of physical connection, then I move back out. And um, one of my favorite science writers, Arthur Zions, he's a contemplative scientist. He quotes Goethe when he says, you know, any object well contemplated opens up a new organ of perception. And I feel like, uh, especially Donna's work does that for me. It's like I have a whole new organ of perception. And I think that's what we do for each other. I sit in lots of practice groups with other photographers. And every time I sit really thoughtfully with someone else's work, it's though they've given me a whole nother piece of the world. Um, and that sitting in the circle with lots of different photographers, I leave with such a bigger sense uh, and, and, and a better sense of complexity. And um, it's, such a, it's such a gift to be able to do that and see that. And so, yeah. This work is so beautiful. And I wanted to ask, 
was there an intentional choice in the particular landscape that you explored repeatedly to make this work? You know, it's really interesting. I, I'm also a process work practitioner. And when I originally made this work, I had no intentions to start round. The round emerged in the process. What my real goal was, was to see if I could actually enter into a truly collaborative relationship with the natural world and the making of the images. So I asked a lot of questions when I was there. And a lot of the questions were more like, how do you want to be seen? Or, And so I have this idea that I have often say when I'm out speaking about that the work, that the circle, that, and how the circle arose for me. To, and, and what an indigenous elder that I study with, she said to me, I think that was very specific to where you were shooting. You're in a southern lush landscape that's very intimate and very close in. She's like, if you were in the desert, you probably would have built a camera that was very linear and very panoramic and that <laughs> that it arose in relationship to place, that that was the right shape for where I was for the Appalachian region and for the forests that I photograph in. And I love the idea of that that the the circle emerged as the right form for that place um i am pretty attached to shooting round now it's all, uh, i i occasionally go back because i have an assignment and i work professionally as a documentary photographer and when i come back to the round work it's like a kind of hidden wholeness it's just um it nourishes me in a way that the other work doesn't um it's the way i the way I now see the world and it just feels so right. But um, yeah, so I just built it. I just picked up my new camera. I designed and built a new camera and um, I put pieces of cameras together and I have like multiple pieces of different cameras that are my favorite parts. And I worked with this <laughs> beautiful machinist here in my county, um, a wonderful man that basically builds like parts for cars and <laughs> Do you Not have a camera, a camera that you would like to show right now? Oh, sure. I can show it to you. Yeah, it's great. It's, um, okay, so this is great. If you can see it. Oh, it's lovely. This is a viewfinder that goes on the back of a 4x5. This back part right here um, is really just the back of a regular Linhoff camera. Um, so if I can remove the viewfinder. So you just see a back of a 4x5. And so that's the four by five back. And basically he machined this plate for me that holds a lens. And then you can't really screw a lens onto this thing. So these mm -hmm. fantastic people, um, Mercury camera, they make, they make interchangeable camera parts, but they're printed out of plastic. They're 3D printed. And so he wow. 3D printed <laughs> an adapter to go in an old Ilex shutter for me. And this is a Mamiya 645 lens. So not to oh get the technical stuff too much, but if all of you know that a lens captures round, but the film capture is smaller than the, the, the lens. So that's why we only get a piece of it. So you just retro that you just move backwards. So as long as your film is bigger than the capture size of the lens, then you're always making a circle. So you wouldn't need, you could just put a mask in your camera, but you wouldn't be getting actually what's so beautiful about these lenses is what they do with the edges. And your mm -hmm. eyesight is that way too. Your eyesight isn't perfect sharp to the edges. Things kind of soften off at the edges. And so um, if, as long as your film is bigger than the circle of the lens, the trick is every lens has a focusing distance. So basically if you determine where the film is, and what the focusing distance is, you just have somebody build a body that is the depth of the actual focus distance of the lens. And so. it, it's at this point where I go like, <laughs> okay, artists, I'm sorry, you're going to need a little math. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's yeah, a beautiful so anyway, intersection. So like, <clears throat> if you think about all of the, um, you know, like, I love geeking about the technical stuff because it's just like what you said. It's not like something irrelevant. It's not something, um, you know, that's extraneous to the process. It's a part of your intention 
and your mm -hmm. attention that you are bringing to it. Right. So, and I think that, you know, I teach photography very differently. I've been teaching for, for probably 30 years and I teach from the, the start with the heart and the technical stuff follows like, and most cameras, you can get pretty automated cameras these days and just let, let the desire lead the, the need for the technical. Right. And so usually somebody gets started and then they're like, Hey, I'd like this a little softer. And we go, okay, this is how that happens. And I, um, so the language of photography, I mean, it's time, right? That's right. We're right at the heart of it. And the, the Greeks talked about two types of time, Kairos and Kronos time. And Kairos time is sequential time. And it is something about these decisive moments, which Tim McCarty Brisson was right about that. But there's also this Kairos time, which is this timeless time. And anybody that's been practicing photography enough knows that there's a magic other time that enters into that moment that becomes a kind of timeless time that transcends. And with the particularly, I mean, it's happened to me in all my projects, but in this one in particular, as my capacity for presence increased, my, the quality of the light changed. And I've been working with the same film for 30 years. I know what that film looks like. And as I spent more and more time, there was a radiance in the environment that was being captured on the film that looked almost infrared. And people would be mm. like, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, there's nothing that's changed from the beginning of this project. But it, but it really, you know, really felt like that there was some collaboration that, that I was moving towards it and it was moving towards me and I can't know that for sure but I did start to know that there's an innate <laughs> inherent beauty that we're if we're lucky enough we get to see into and I think photography is this incredible practice that invites us into that into that into that seeing right into the heart of beauty and um yeah it's I I, I think there's no other medium like it it's just um, just remarkable to me. Pick up a camera, everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to take a moment to just express my appreciation for the audience and, again, encourage them to keep asking questions or leaving comments or offering, you know, offering up their own thoughts because that's part of the fun here. Um, uh, are there questions that you would like to ask each other right now? No pressure at all <laughs> but if there's something that occurs to you I would love for you to start start a three-way conversation well one thing I want to say to Susan is when I see your work and I know you've made the conscious decision to make it round I do pinhole and I see in my mind pinhole is round in my head so even when I get that square image or rectangular image in my camera I have had that idea in my head that it is a round well, let me circular show image. the picture of the pinhole camera since I all the pinhole so cameras there's one yeah Donna actually gave me three of these coffee cans and they're all outside now attached to a tree <laughs> <laughs> but um, besides this work I do a lot of other pinhole work in nature with pinhole cameras that I make that are larger than those and I I see Susan's work and I see similarities between mine and hers because I think pinhole does focus like she does on, it has an inf infinite focus as pinhole. And when I look at this work, it's like you see deep into that forest. You don't just see the edges of it. You're looking into it. And I think that's what contemplative photography does. It's not just, here's a pretty picture. I don't know how, um, it's looking how well in. people can see this, but, you can see if when you see this in person, if you want to come tomorrow night, um, you can see that things are more like there's differing focus in different parts of the image, like what Susan was talking about with the edges, with the leaves here. And I'm trying to hold the camera as steady as possible and the leaves at the edges here. So I wanted to pull that in and keep going, Donna. <laughs> oh, so, so. It's it's just fascinating how different photographers still connect in the way they see nature. I mean, it, it it's it's your eye, it's your vision, but the camera does make the final decision, don't you think, Susan? I mean, you put it out there, 
And I, I think so. I always think of this like quaternity of like the, the photographer, the subject, right? And then the camera. And then in, in a sense, the culture, you know, we can't ever really separate ourselves from the, the, the field of, of our culture that we are in. And I, I definitely think I, my cameras become almost um, embodied to me. Like I, I, I care greatly about them. When I picked this up today, it's new and I was wrapping it like in this blanket. <laughs> but, new and I baby. Like I was like taking a new baby home because this camera uh, and I are probably going to spend the next 10, 12 years together. Um, and we're going to be seeing the world together, you know, and it's, uh, so it's, it's such a gift to, um, to have the, the technology that we do, but also, um, yeah. I, you know, I, I was thinking, Donna, that I imagine that the reason pinhole feels round is that, like round is the archetypal symbol or also feeling that we get around wholeness. And when I teach somatic practices to people, when they walk up to a sunset or see beauty, there's a way that the sensation of their body rounds out you know, when we are focused and intent, our sight and, and the energetics of ourselves is, is very linear. You know, it's very pointed. It's very linear. But when we get into that really open hearted space where we feel really connected and centered, the energetic field does get spherical. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I think so. I think yeah. so. And, you know, in pinhole, that can happen, too. If you're if your camera, if your paper is bigger than the image of the pinhole, the edges fade off. No, it's not round, but it's still that same idea that there is a, a focus, a, a, a connection in there, and then the edges are just like faded away. So it's not as round as yours, but similar in some way. It's similar. <laughs> well, Donna for sure. came over. Donna came over, was it last week? Maybe yeah. Last week. Helped me start to, um, she brought over some ideas for how to make um, round pinholes. And we were playing with oh, cool. and experimenting together. And, um, that was fun. That, that was, was really, fun. Yeah, that was really lovely. Yeah. Earlier Jocelyn, today you I were. Want, oh, I want to ask you questions. You know, okay. you know I have this whole rap about, you know, that, Art, that artists, uh, we in many ways, we do a lot of the emotional heavy lifting for our culture, right? We're there, we're witnessing, we're bearing witness, we're, um, we're seers, we're sayers, you know? <laughs> and there's this constant fight, right, about the limited numbers of galleries that are available. And then in a way, we're always just preaching to the choir, which is fantastic. Let's preach to the choir. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just, I'm so moved by by this, by what you've done, by just bringing art in right back into your home, right back into your community. And um, I wish every single person committed to that. And I'd love to hear more about how you made that decision and how, like, it'd be possible, like, let's make it possible for everyone. Tell us, tell us your magic secret. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, a lot of frustration, maybe. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to be answering these questions tonight. <laughs> I feel a little unprepared. Um, I mean, honestly, the story I tell people is that there just wasn't a place. And so what else am I going to do? Um, it, it's, hard, it's hard to talk about it as something uh, premeditated because it totally wasn't. Um, it was just one of those, um, I, I like the concept of, I, I don't know if you've heard it discussed, the adjacent possible. Um, like this, it, it's, it's place, it's like what you said, how your work is shaped by the place. Like it actually took shape as you were working through it. And as I was working through the problem of how do I share my art in a rural place when everything is closed in the middle of the pandemic, and I just happened to notice that um, this is my dining room, everybody. This, this is just a room in my house. Like, there's the rest of the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, it's like, I wanted to have people over. I missed having people over. I missed that connection. And I, 
I was already putting my work on the walls to photograph it, to share it with the world. And then I thought, okay, well, the adjacent possible is that other people can hang their work on my walls. I hang other people's work on my walls anyway. It just, it, it sort of, it's kind of like when you, um, when you spill something on your table or some materials and you, all of a sudden you look down and they belong together. <laughs> um, you know, and I just, ha I also just happen to have the resources to build a website and do Instagram live. And I'm, I'm dependent on these technologies to make this possible in many ways, at least in terms of the pandemic, but, but they were, they were part of what the adjacent possible was when all of this was formed. And, um, I, I especially have, I have a chip on my shoulder about um, domestic spaces being just as valid as commercial museums and how so much of the important work that is done in cultivating people is done in the home. And that's the same thing is true for art. Like if whenever you hear an artist talk, you always hear about how were they brought up? Were they like, were they encouraged in their creativity? What did their parents do? And all of that is about their home. So why is art taken up and away and out of the home so often? And that's absolutely not to denigrate, you know, the traditional crafts that are associated with home um, and all of that. Like, I, I definitely have a very expansive idea of like what valid art making processes are, you know, everything from, from traditional woodcrafts and clay and pottery and to the conceptual performance art realm, you know, that people like to make fun of. And it's, it's all a part of that vision of, um, of a holistic approach to where art is placed in my life. Like in, in many ways, I feel like this is a self portrait of myself because um, like I, I'm a primary caregiver and how, how do you get to art openings with babies when they have to go to bed at like eight o'clock at night? Oh, look, I can do it in my house. <laughs> so um, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I think that um, it does answer the question. And, and, and I love this idea that, um, you know, often, often some of the most creative things we do emerge out of necessity. And um, I, I think it, uh, I think it's fantastic. Well, and I also think it mirrors a lot of what you did. And we can transition to talking about your six feet project that was also pandemic inspired. <laughs> well, well, the one that's probably the closest is actually Maker Circle because True. I had, so I was living in Asheville. I was already paying too much rent. I needed to print a bunch of work. I had a show coming up. So I looked for a space. The art spaces were going to cost as much as my crazy one bedroom apartment was costing. And so I started to think, well, I'm going to leave Asheville. And friends were like, don't leave. And I said, okay, you have 30 days. I can't be more than 30 minutes away from Asheville find let's find something together like we I just put the word out to everyone and when this place showed up I had to build a dark room and it's beautiful it already had a kitchen um I actually got this house and didn't even know it had an upstairs I literally drove up went into the garage saw that there was plumbing in there and was like here's my chance <laughs> like I don't I think I spent all of two seconds in the house and there was a second canning kitchen in this big garage so I was like no I can build a dark room here we're good and um, after that was done and after the show went up and after I discovered there were three bedrooms in the upstairs of this farmhouse, um, I thought, you know, I've got, there's, there's at least 50% of the time that this dark room is not in use. And why not just invite other people to be in this space and see if there's some collaborative um, projects that could happen. And so it was similar in that sense of like, what do we have? And I think um, I, I love that about artists and I love that about female identified artists and in my life that there's so much generosity that when we get, when we get what nourishes us right, there's almost an immediate impulse to want to extend that generosity out to the community. And um, I, I think I think when we're nourished, we want to feed. Like it's just, or I don't know, you know, you know words, but 
I saw I saw one of my friends watching here. Hi, Joy. Mm -hmm. And she gave me this beautiful quote from Rumi on a piece of paper that is up in my studio wall that says, um, never give from your depths, but from your overflow. Mm. And that immediately what I thought of when you were talking about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, Donna, would you like to comment on any of these themes at the moment? You've been very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really think both of you, I admire you so much for what you do for community. And I think that is one of the basis of my practice too. It's not just personal, but it's to involve others in the work. The work you're looking at there, there's a lot of work by other people that put these cameras up at their place, took them down, sent them to me. I scanned them. I put them up. You know, and being with the big camera, that is my new community project. Well, it's about four years old now, but we try to do a lot of things for the community. We put up artworks on walls of breweries and buildings downtown. And I think to get out, art out of the museums and out of art galleries so people can see it, I think that's where we need to be going now. Because during the pandemic, we did a project called um, Women Vote. We took pictures of women with masks on that said vote, and we put them all up right before the election in Knoxville. That was a community project. We had people help us. So I think art goes beyond just something that feeds yourself. It has to feed others also. And that's where I love that, the overflow of it all. If you're fed in your work, then you have a lot more to give to others, a lot more you can give to the community. And I think that's really important to do. And you and Susan are both doing that. <laughs> Well, and we can all encourage each other and uh, build each other up when we, you know, start to feel tired after a long, <laughs> after a long haul. And, um, and Jocelyn, speaking, I just go ahead. To add just one little piece of that, and which is to also say, there's something really also countercultural about just pulling away, just disconnecting from the world. I mean, when I did that first year of the enveloping landscape. I don't think I would have had those outcomes, but I went into a completely solo, like I took a solid year long sabbatical where I was inaccessible to pretty much everyone in my life. And wow. then out of that, I mean, I had pretty much, I mean, just to be really blunt about it. I mean, I had, I was on the verge of a serious breakdown from years and years and years of overgiving and overextending and, uh, and also, you know, being in being in a female body, you know, the amount of trauma, I, I you know, I had multiple experiences of sexual assault in my life. I mean, just a lot of things that accumulate. And there was just a point where my body was just couldn't carry any more pain. It just couldn't carry any more. And the I felt so selfish and so um just no, don't pulling it. pulling away <laughs> was just like oh everybody's gonna die without me I mean it was ridiculous now that I look back at it but finding time for myself felt it felt cruel to the world or something like I wasn't that important <laughs> like which is a fantastic thing to learn I'm not that important like the world's perfectly fine if I take a year off no but and, you know um, I think you know. I think the pandemic did that for a lot of us mm. It may not have been personal trauma, but I know that year that I spent here, I, we didn't do any workshops, any shows. I mean, I stayed home. And I think that really helped a lot of us reach deeper inside ourselves and find out what we had to give or to make for ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And there were certainly some people who had a different experience during the pandemic who needed that help. <laughs> Yeah. And for sure and that's where the six feet project came in we launched a project that was a series of practice groups and meetups for um people around the world some practice photographers for some coming and the only thing we asked was that people shared from their hearts what their lived experiences were during that time and um our website which is called it's six feet dot photography and um over time, so we, we launched a hashtag, so we launched a life at six feet hashtag. There's probably over 9,000 images in that hashtag now um, from, I think we've counted, a, we're up to like 120 countries. And wow. every week, people with such vulnerability and generosity showed up for and to each other. And the practice groups were launched, hosted free of charge 
photographers offered six weeks. They launched um, Frances Bukowski. I don't know if she's on this one of my favorite ones that got launched. I saw her. I saw yeah. her. I don't know if she's Anatomy still here, but home. I still think about Anatomy of a Home. She got together with a group of people and asked them to intimately explore their relationship to different rooms of their house. I mean, I can think about some of those images right now. It brings tears to my eyes and just the, the, you know, we were going through a cultural, we we're culturally vulnerable together, right? And some of the most creative work I have seen. Um, and speaking of vulnerability, six feet, we could launch a kind of theme and we have on our practice groups. And I think we're going to, uh, for the, the summer, we normally have artist talk for the summer. We're just going to have an open practice group on Wednesday nights at seven. And I think vulnerability is going to be one of the topics. You know, how does that impact the way we create? Oh, somebody says the Six Feet Project <laughs> saved me during the pandemic. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'm just, uh, I, I, during such a difficult time, and I don't want to downplay how hard this time was for people, but um, I think I learned something. I think it restored my faith in humanity. The, the generosity was beyond what I would have imagined, how much people were there for each other. And um, so grateful, so grateful that I got to have now, that experience. Susan, is the show down in Asheville still up through July the 31st, 31st, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's in, for those of you, if you don't know Asheville well, if you, if you just Google the French Broad Chocolate Factory, not the lounge, because the lounge is downtown, but the factory is on River Street. That's also called the Ramp Studios. And in the Ramp Studio space is the, um, is the exhibition, 109 photographers. I can't remember how many countries we counted, but I've forgotten how many, I think 15, 16 countries. Um, really, really beautiful show. And then we're now accepting work for an exhibition that will be up. Um, the Durham Arts Council turned over their entire gallery spaces to us for the month of October for the Click Photography Festival. So if you're a Southern artist, photographer, this is a photography show, and um, particularly if you're in North Carolina, um, feel free to, to drop an email to info at sixfeet.photography, and um, we'll, we'll tell you more about that call for engagement for work for that show. But if you are local to the area and you happen to be in Asheville, go see some awesome work and amazing impactful work and grab yourself some of that chocolate, right? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> When we when we lot we had to build out that show. We had a lot of wall build, and it was an amazing team of people that came together. And um, and uh, it, there's so much chocolate. You know, you go to a bar, you smell like smoke. There's so that building smells like chocolate. Like you go home and your clothes are just like <laughs> chocolate. And then I speaking of food, shout out to um, Morgan Bailey, who's here, who just really spearheaded putting together a catalog of that show. She had a team of um, people working with her, designers, but she, she spearheaded that project. And the catalog is beautiful, and it really captures such an amazing time. And so up on our website, when that catalog is released, we'll put it up there. And we're, we're, it's going out at cost, so we, we did everything we could to keep that, that cost low. But it's a beautiful collection of work. I just looked at my watch and we only have like a few oh, minutes wow. left. <laughs> um, I may, I may go over a little bit, you guys. Um, Donna, I would love to hear a little bit more from you or some reflection on all the things that we've been talking about. And, um, and I also want to remind everybody here, thank you for being here. Donna's work is available for sale and we are benefiting um, One Acre Cafe, which is a nonprofit in Johnson City which feeds everybody regardless of their ability to pay. And they were such a sustaining force in downtown Johnson City for folks um, who were deeply affected by the pandemic. And Chef Bob, I'm going to show off the plate of food here. I just picked this up today. Chef Bob here has a whole bunch of local... Local goodies, fresh food made from local farmers. Thank you to Larry Moore and Lynn Gavette and Best Greenhouse and also to Michelle and Ashley and the lovely folks there. And I wanted to tell you guys that these flowers were actually gifted to me for this show by a pair of my lovely friends who could not be here. And um, 
the florist, um, she's a local florist, she actually went onto the Facebook page to try and pick flowers that would go with this work. So uh, she, uh. <laughs> it, was, it was a very special little moment. And so Anna Marie Florist gets a special shout out. And it was just a super touching, um, touching addition to this evening that I wanted to share with y'all. And I thought it was just super sweet. And I need to stop talking about it because I'll probably start, you know, um, <laughs> face leaking. Um, anyway. <laughs> so, um, I don't know what to say in summary. Donna, I want to make sure that you have some a freedom to share some more comments too. Oh, I, I just want to say, I appreciate what you do. I think this is fabulous. Thank you for letting me be a, be a part of this. And thanks Susan too. Oh, and uh, we're going to do something together, some collaborative thing, all of us. So. Oh, I, yes. I think that would be super great. Um, and, of course, this live stream is going to end and be archived on the Eat Art Space Instagram page. So, if you know, people will be able to return to it there. And I'm about to hop on Facebook and just do a little tour of the gallery. And I hope that you guys can go to the live. Ugh, where is it? It's eatart.space slash live if you would like to you know respond to any comments for anyone who happens to be there or hang out there for a little bit while I just introduce people to your work and share a little bit of what was talked about here does anybody I'm going to just call out to the audience real quick and say if folks would like to ask some more questions or a final final question of the two of you um, I'm going to leave that open and also um just thank you for being here. <laughs> this was such a privilege to have this. Um, and I, as I'm waiting for folks to perhaps offer a comment, I, I want to invite everybody who is watching here or who, um, or the two of you to my house tomorrow night because I am opening my house. Um, folks can message me through Instagram to get my address and come and see the work from 6 to 8 p.m. tomorrow night. I'll have some you know, light refreshments and some beverages and everyone can come and walk around my dining room and mix and mingle with people. I've, I've already heard from a few people who are coming, which will be very exciting. Um, so yeah, check out the website and see some past exhibits. And um, I really, really like soaked up this conversation. This was a, a wonderfully timed, edifying talk to have. Well, and happy anniversary to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to close this out, save the video, and hop onto Facebook, and I will hopefully see some of you there. Folks can follow me there, Facebook slash eatart.space slash live. I'm trying to remember that. And um, be sure to check out Susan Patrice, at Susan Patrice, and at Donna Moore 32 because they are absolutely worth following. And um, Maker Circle, and Six Feet, and <laughs> A1 Lab Arts, and the big camera. <laughs> you can't do just one thing, you guys, right? <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right. Much love and admiration to you both, and I'll catch uh, you later. Thank you. Thank you.